Okay, so um, any question? Can anyone remind me where we stopped last time? Did we stop here? Where we were showing how the you know demand curve shifts and the distinction between shift in demand and change in quantity demanded. It was like inferior goods and non-goods. Sorry? It was like inferior goods and non-goods. Okay, so we did cover the variations of different factors that affect the shift in demand and supply. Thank you very much. So we were after identifying, so we are still in chapter three, we are in the demand part of the market, market model where we are trying to understand how do consumers make their purchasing decisions from the market. The market that we're looking at is the uh, product market where final goods and services are bought and sold. So in this market, the consumer or the household is on the buying side, the producer or the farm is on the supply side. We defined something called demand curve in the previous class, which shows the negative relationship between price and quantity demanded, which means how much uh, a person is willing to buy at some given price. We showed that our demand curve is downward sloping, which shows a negative relationship between price and quantity demanded, which is mainly su supported by this theory called law of demand. And in the last class, we also looked at the, the two competing theories, not competing, complementary theories that explains why law of demand exists. Law of demand says that whenever price goes down, quantity demanded increases. In the last class, we showed that whenever price goes down, it creates these two effects for our buyer. One is called substitution effect, where our buyer uh, buys the cheaper product. And then there is this so-called income effect where as the price of a certain product goes down, the purchasing power of the buyer goes up, so he or she buys more. Both the income effect and substitution effect together tells us that whenever price goes down, quantity demanded for a particular product goes up. That's why our demand curve is downward sloping. Now what we also started in the last class was to see the factors that could cause this demand curve to shift, either to the right or to the left. We are, from day one, we argued that any factor other than the price of the good will cause the demand curve to shift. So whenever price changes, your demand curve is not going to shift. Whenever price changes, you are going to move along the same demand curve, but if anything other than price that is important for your demand changes, like your income, like price of related goods, like your taste, your demand curve is going to shift. So today, we are gonna look at those. The, the first point that we looked at in the previous class was this importance of income in determining demand for any consumer. We said that not all goods respond to income changes in the same way. More importantly, we were talking about two distinct type of goods. The first kind of goods uh, were labeled as normal goods. These are the goods whenever income increases, your demand for that good, go, you know, good goes up. So your demand shifts to the right whenever income increases. So we can actually have... Now, uh, what I realized is that we have this smart... Thing and it's, it's actually kind of pretty good. Okay, so let's see if I can if I can use this. So I need to get out, and then I need to get this guy. Okay, so for a normal good, if if income increases, demand increases. That's a simple relationship. Uh, examples of normal good are many, clothing, restaurant meals, vacations, you name it. Okay? Um, what is interesting for uh, you know, our exam is the second category of good, which we call the no inferior good. Now, uh, the inferior good is a good uh, for which as your income increases, your quantity demanded, or let's just, uh, let's not, you know, 
Wait, is there a eraser somewhere? Oh man. Yeah, this is an eraser, but I don't know how to use that. So your demand goes down. Okay, simple idea. Okay, uh, why is that? Because the goods that we label as inferior goods are goods such as ramen noodles, uh, which you buy a lot when you have less income because you are poor, you don't really care about the quality or you don't care about the brand. Something that also can be labeled in inferior goods. But as your income increases, you increasingly feel like you should buy better you know, carbohydrate substitutes. So you start buying pasta and you don't buy as many ramen noodles that you were buying before. So an increase in income really decreases the demand for inferior goods. So that's the two kinds of goods that respond very differently towards changes in income. So that's a, a review of what we covered in the previous class. Now let's move on. So we, are, we saw that uh, depending on what kind of goods you have, either inferior versus normal, a change in your income affects your demand in a fundamentally different way. What we're going to do now is think about other factors that affect your demand. And uh, one of them uh, is this idea of related goods. So let's start with the discussion that most of the goods that we buy from the market sometimes are you know, purchased together or they are purchased as a, a substitute for each other. What do we mean by that? Imagine you are going to a marketplace and you're buying coffee, right? Coffee is something that you like to drink and for most of us, with some exceptions, we would like to uh, you know, uh, you know, eat sugar with coffee. So coffee and sugar, these are goods that we always buy together. Okay? The economist who came up with this idea was a Russian economist. His name is Leon Tiev and got a Nobel Prize. To, because he, he was the first person to point out that in our everyday life, a lot of economic activities are performed together. For Leontief, uh, he was talking about these uh, goods that are uh, either purchased together or these goods that are being used together. He used a word called complements to indicate goods that are always uh, either bought together or used together. The example that Leontief provided, which unfortunately we will not be able to see in this rudimentary course, but if some of you take uh, an intermediate microeconomics course, you will see his contribution. He was talking about uh, the example of these two goods being a person and a shovel. It's a, a very simple, very rudimentary, very basic idea about how things are done together, right? A person cannot work without a shovel. A shovel cannot work by itself. So they need each other. So that's the example of a complementary <coughs> In our marketplace, complementary goods could be many, like coffee and sugar, but the, but the one that you are looking at is, the, the first one that you are looking at is substitutes. I'm going to ignore the substitute for the time being. I'm going to start with complements, because I think complementary goods, uh, you know, makes a, li a little bit more sense. So, Big Mac and McDonald's fries, my children love them. Hot dogs and hot dog buns. I don't know how much you like hot dogs. I used to, but I've, I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying not to eat those. Left shoes and right shoes, right? <coughs> Left shoes and right shoes. That's a very interesting uh, you know, example, right? A couple of years ago, I saw a movie that a guy uh, came up with this very smart scheme of importing shoes from a foreign country while he was only importing black shoes. So imagine that you want to import a pair of shoes from a foreign country and you have to pay tax, right? So what he did, he came up with this idea that he first imported a bunch of left shoes. So when you, you know, buy half of a pair, these are called imperfect goods and government doesn't tax you because these are damaged goods. Do you understand that? So you are importing a damaged product for which you don't pay any tax. After six months, he imports the right shoes. So that was a scam. It was a, it was a very, very interesting movie. 
because you know, the idea is that right shoes and left shoes are always bought together, regardless of uh, their price. Um, in case of a McDonald's, uh, you know, uh, burger and McDonald's fries, we understand that these two things are purchased together. So the question that we want to ask now is what happens when price of one of these complementary goods change? Okay. So imagine that in case of the complementary goods, you are thinking that the price you are considering a situation where price of your fries, FR means fries, goes up. And you want to understand how an increase in the price of fries affect your demand for burger, McDonald's, uh, the Big Mac. Okay, so I am going to write quantity demanded for my Big Mac here, and I want to fill in the blanks. Are we all clear on that? So, so if the price of fries go up, I know that my quantity demanded for my fries go down according to my law of demand, right? There's nothing magic about this. So when the price of fries go up, I buy less fries. But if I buy less fries, I also buy less burgers. That doesn't make sense. Because I buy them together. So notice that our experiment started with the assumption that the price of fries have gone up. And it ends up affecting my demand for burgers, which are complementary goods. So, graphically, when the price of fries go up, demand for burgers shift to the left. And obviously vice versa. If the price of fries went down, quantity demanded for fries would have gone up, meaning that you are now going to buy more fries. And if you buy more fries, your quantity demanded for burgers are going to go up. So this is how the price of a related good, a complementary good, affects the demand for a product. In this case, the price of the complementary good went, down, went up and the demand for the product in question went down. Demand for the product in question went down. Any question? Make sense? <coughs> The opposite of the story is the, uh, the substitute one. Um, so when I talk about substitute goods, I don't really talk about burgers and you know stuff. Uh, the, the best example of a substitute good is probably Coke and Pepsi, right? A lot of us, including me, will argue that probably a Big Mac is not the same as a Whopper, right? Have you? Uh, eaten uh, any Whopper you know, in recent times. They have dramatically improved the quality of that, that particular burger. So, but for a, for a, <laughs> it's true by the way. <laughs> they should give me money. They should, I am actually providing them free <clears throat> marketing. Okay, um, so I don't know about jeans and khakis any also, but I know that Coke and Pepsi are probably good substitutes. Although I have met people who have a very strong brand loyalty, loyalty towards one of these products. So let's ignore brand loyalty for the time being. We, so we are, are we all clear on what brand loyalty is? Brand loyalty is when you buy something uh, without really thinking about what the good is giving you uh, or you don't even care about the price. So brand loyalty is an irrational economic behavior, which we are going to ignore, ignore. Although very interesting economic behavior, but we are going to ignore them. So with that, ignoring brand loyalty, Coke and Pepsi probably are substitute. They are probably very good substitutes, right? So now, again, the same idea. Imagine that the price of Pepsi goes up. PP means price of Pepsi goes up. 
if the price of Pepsi goes up, I know that my quantity demanded for Pepsi will go down according to the law of demand, right? So price of Pepsi is going up, I am buying less Pepsi. So why is this interesting? It is interesting because there is a substitute good available in the market and that is Coke and its price hasn't changed. So if the price of Coke suddenly goes up, Pepsi goes up, the price of Coke doesn't change between these two substitute goods, the Coke is now a cheaper alternative. Do we all see that? So, um, when there is an increase in price of Pepsi, there is, a, there is a decrease in the quantity demanded for Pepsi, but that at the same time will increase the quantity demanded for, let's say, Coke, C-O-K-E. And that will increase the quantity demanded for Coke. Now, when the quantity demanded for a particular good changes without changes in the price, what happens to the demand curve? Okay. Are we all clear on that? Whenever price changes and your quantity demanded changes, we saw that this is just a movement along the curve, right? You move from one point to another point. But when your quantity demanded changes without any change in price, your curve shifts. Are we all clear on that? Please make sure you uh, rephrase this idea many, many times because many of you are going to make this mistake in the exam because there are questions in the exam related to this. Okay. So, in this particular example case, uh, imagine that there is an increase in price of Pepsi uh, and that causes an increase in demand for Coke which actually means that the demand curve for Coke shifts to the right because Coke and Pepsi are substitute goods. Any question? Okay, so that's interesting. Is this true? I think it's a very valid question. You might ask yourself, the stuff that we just you know, talked about, do they have any empirical resemblance or significance? The answer is surprisingly yes. The one that you are seeing in the board is a new study, but let's use our logic and figure and look at the price of Coke and Pepsi over the last, let's say, 50 years. Have, ha has there been any instance where you have seen the price of Coke being substantially different from the price of Pepsi? Did we all un un understand my question? My question is very simple. Do the price of Coke and Pepsi move at the same <coughs> direction? Do they always move together? <coughs> if a store gives a discount on Coke, they will also give a discount on Pepsi. Now, at, towards the very end, uh, of this course, we are going to talk about situations where firms collude <coughs> under, under the table. They have some kind of arrangement where they make sure that you know, one, one firm's strategy does not affect the sale or the revenue or the pricing of the other firms. We are going to call them cartels and we are going to say that cartels are illegal, which means that in, according to US law, if Coke and Pepsi uh, you know, sign a contract that whenever Coke rises the price, raises the price, Pepsi will also raise the price at the same time, it will be illegal, according to US law. It's called an antitrust law, something that we will not touch in this course. Uh, there is no such, you know, official agreement between Coke and Pepsi, but you can do the math, right? Anytime you see these two products, their price being changing, their prices are, you know, very much moving in the same direction. A surprising fact is between you know, Big Mac and Whopper, whose prices are not the same. Whopper is a little bit more expensive. I don't know, I forgot which one is more expensive. But they are not evenly priced. But whenever the price of one product goes up, <coughs> the price of the other product goes up as well. The question is why? The question is why? The question is, the answer to that question, a more profound answer is competition. The reason why Coke and Pepsi are in competition is because they are subsidies. Right. When you think about the automobile industry, 
you can argue that there is probably no competition between a Toyota uh, car cell with, let's say, uh, you know, sort of like a Lexus SUV because they are being sold to completely two different segments of the market. Are we all clear on that? Because they are not substitutes. But a Nissan Sentra could be a good substitute to a Toyota car cell or a Toyota Corolla because they are of the same size. Both of them are targeting the same market. Are we all clear on that? These are very, very serious market microeconomic issues that have very you know, deep economic implications. So the example that the slide is talking about is, again, a very interesting example. It is talking about whether you know, tablets and e-readers are substitutes or not. Now, this is a very controversial question, right? Uh, to some extent, we could argue that they are probably substitutes because you can read on both of them, right? But obviously tablets can do a lot more than you know, simple e-readers. The authors provide you with some data, and data is always important. What they tell you that over time, as the number of tablets being sold increases, the number of e-readers being sold in the market is going down, okay? Even if you do not believe that they are substitutes, you can at least uh, you know, infer from the data that they are probably sold in the same market. They are in, in competition with each other. And <coughs> that means that to some extent, these are substitutes. Probably not a perfect one, right? A perfect substitute would be Coke and Pepsi, where the only difference between these products are just brands. Right? Are we all clear on that? Well, one of you say no. <laughs> I actually had a friend like that, who was a cook guy. Okay, um, so we covered income, we covered uh, prices of relative go related goods. In that context, we covered the distinction between normal and inferior good, and we also covered the distinction between perfect and a substitute and complementary goods. But to most, to many, most of the economists, these are not the factors that. Uh, are the most important issue when we think about demand. Probably, according to most, and including myself, the most important factor that affects your demand is your taste. Is your taste. I will start this part with an example. Okay? I want to talk about mad cow disease. Okay, anyone familiar with what a mad cow disease is? Mad cow disease started approximately around 1990s in Europe. Uh, before 2000, Europe was the largest meat market in the world, meat industry and market. Uh, recently, China has surpassed them, and China is now the largest meat market in the world. China is the largest consumer of meat in the world right now. But in the 90s, Europe used to be the largest consumer of meat. So around 1992, this mad cow disease came about where if you eat certain portion of a, bee, uh, of a cow, uh, you contract some kind of disease, it's a neurological disease, and you die. Okay? Simple idea. My brother-in-law uh, <coughs> used to live in England at that time. He still lives there. In 1994, the price of one pound of beef was about 10 bucks, ten dollar. Meat is very expensive in Europe. In, this is 1992, one pound of beef about ten dollar. Within two years, one pound of beef became approximately fifty cents. Fifty cents. Okay, did people buy a lot of beef at that time because it was cheap? No, people stopped buying meat because they were afraid, right? So you might think that, well, beef, the price of beef have gone down from being $10 per pound to 50 cent. People will buy a lot of meat, right, because of the law of demand or whatever we have learned, right? The answer is surprising. Nobody bought beef at that time. It took about 10 years for the beef industry in Europe to recover. And then you had another major scandal, you know, a couple of years ago. As it turned out that, you are familiar with that. The horse meat one? Yeah, 
So as it, as it turned out, Ukraine is one of the largest suppliers of meat in Europe, and they were mixing different kinds of meat, right? So be careful when you go to Europe and you know, be careful about the meat. So what happened was that the demand for meat went down dramatically, and it has got nothing to do with price. In this case, the price actually went down even then people were buying less meat. Why? Because their taste changed. Their taste changed. Taste is a very powerful idea. Right? When I first came to USA around 2001, there used to be one Dunkin' Donuts in every you know, neighborhood. Right? Dunkin' Donuts were very popular. Between 2001 and 2004, Dunkin' Donuts filed for bankruptcy. Does anyone know that? They, they have recovered. The Dunkin' Donuts is again in business, but in 2004, a giant industry uh, you know, leader like Dunkin' Donuts filed for bankruptcy. Why? They were not selling enough. Why? Because people were not, people were not buying enough. There was no scandal. People just became more health conscious, and they stopped buying donuts. So you see that you know, out of all the factors that really affect demand, taste probably is the most important one. Okay. Any question? Are we all clear on how taste affects your demand? So anytime the taste for a certain product increases, you are going to buy more of that good regardless of the price. And anytime the taste for that good goes down, like you become afraid or you become more health conscious, your demand is going to shift to the left. <coughs> Makes sense. The next one is also interesting. Okay, uh, population and demographics, I think they are interesting, but they are uh, kind of predictable, right? If the population of a country increases, meaning that there are more people to buy the same good, demand is going to go up, right? And the idea of population is kind of connected with the idea of a demographical change. For example, if an economy has more <laughs> elderly population, because more people are surviving their old age, demand for Medicare and medical services are going to go up automatically. There is no relationship with price. As you go older, you grow older, you have to have medical services. So population size and demography can affect the demand for a certain product as well. Whenever there is an increase in population or an increase in demography, demand shifts to the right. Okay, before we um, <clears throat> conclude the final note, there is one other factor that we need to spend a little bit time on, and this one is probably the trickiest of all the factors that affect your demand. Okay, did I talk about the 1942 famine? Can anyone remind me? India. We talked about the 1942 famine in India, where a lot of people died and people didn't have any answer to why, uh, you know, during a bumper year production of food, India had a market situation where nobody could buy anything from the market. People starved and died. Okay? Uh, this is probably when uh, economists were noticing the importance of expectation and how it affects the market. We are going to talk about expectation in several topics in this course, because expectation, just like taste, <coughs> is one of the fundamental factors that affects market. We're going to start with expectation from the buyer side. Let's say a buyer, or you, me, expect that in the future, the price of goods that you are buying will go up. So you expect the price of the goods that you buy in the future is going to go up. Buy what do you do? Buy more. Do we all see that? So when can you do that? When can you buy, you know, buy more of the goods whose price you expect to go up in the future? Can you buy all of these goods? Can you buy milk and store it for five years? And when five years comes, the price of the good goes up and you you know, take that milk out of your refrigerator, you simply cannot. 
right? There is a there is a deeper uh, implication for how expectation affects your demand. Are we all clear on this? So let's try to you know explore this idea. Okay. Um, the terms that are being used in the slides are kind of confusing. I will try to explain how expectation about future affects your demand from a slightly different and macro perspective. <coughs> and in that process, I want to bring a very powerful economics concept. It's called saving. 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 So I'm going to start with this idea first. I'm going to think about a good which is perishable. So I do not want to, uh, you know, be concerned with a situation where uh, buyers will like to hoard and store up a lot of the goods, because that's interesting but beyond the scope of this course. I'm going to think about a situation where PE, which is an expected future price of the good that you buy, goes up. So if this is a perishable good, you know that you cannot really store that good. You need to keep part of your income stored so that when tomorrow comes, you can use your income to buy that good. Make sense? Are we all clear on this? This is where we are going to use this very important economic concept called save. Where you do not spend part of your income. You keep that income either in a bank or in a financial market or simply under your bed. Okay? So when you expect that future price is going up, your savings increase. Okay? You save more, but you understand that if you save more today, that means you consume less today, right? You buy less today. Right? Because how much you save today and how much you consume or meaning spend today are related. Right? Your macroeconomics course will establish a more stronger relationship between that. But we should all have a good understanding as how our saving and how our spending are connected. They are positively connected. If my savings go up, my consumption negatively connected. If, my, if I save more, I spend less. If I spend more, I save less. Right? So if I, my saving goes up, my spending or my consumption goes down, this is like a reduction in my income, right? Or the amount of money that I'm spending in the economy. Regardless of how you think about this, if you save more today, you spend less today, your demand shifts to the left. So, when there is an increase in future price, not today's price, you are going to save more, you are going to spend less, your demand is going to go down. Your demand curve is going to shift to the left. Okay? That's one way to think about it. But what if the good is perishable, is not perishable? What if I could store that good? Make sense? The example that was just talked about, you know, just, just discussed, right? So if the good is perishable, the price, if the future price of my good increases, I am going to save more, I am going to consume less, my demand is going to go down today for the same good. If, on the other hand, the good is, per is not perishable, I can store that good, it makes perfect sense to buy more of the good today when it is cheaper. Right? So the distinction here is whether the good is a perishable good or not. If the good is perishable, then an increase in future price reduces your demand today. Let's conclude that by saying that your quantity demanded goes down in case of a perishable good. When the good is non-perishable, And there is an expected, uh, an increase in the expected price of the good, meaning that in the future, the good is going to become more expensive. 
you are going to buy that good more today. Your demand for that good is going to go up. So you are going to buy those goods a lot, store that somewhere, and when tomorrow comes, when the price is higher, you, don't, you are not going to the market. You are just using the good that you just stored by, by buying more today. So are we all clear on how the nature of the good really affects your behavior uh, towards expected future changes in price? Okay. The way the book talks about this expected future price change is kind of confusing. And I want you guys to be to have a more broader idea about this. Any question? Okay. Um, there is a very fascinating exp example provided in the slide. I'm going to skip that. It talks about Apple. Um, please read that on your own. Before we con so that sort of concludes our discussion about demand and how demand changes, what factors cause changes in demand. So what we have learned so far is actually two things. First of all, we have, see we have learned about what demand is, and we have learned about how demand changes. Simple idea. We're gonna, so we are going to summarize this idea by uh, once again talking about the distinction between change in demand and change in quantity demanded. Uh, in a very simple grassy graphical setup, imagine that you are either moving from A to C or you are moving from A to B. When you are moving from A to B, when you are moving from A to B, this is movement along the demand curve. And we are going to call it change in quantity demanded. The delta that you are seeing is a shorthand for change. So when you move from A to B, this is a movement along the same demand curve. The reason why you move from A to B is because only price changed, nothing else changed. So you move from one point of the demand curve to another point of the demand curve. This is called a movement along the demand curve or just simple change in quantity demanded. When you move from A to C, you are moving from one demand curve to another demand curve. So a movement from A to C, I'm going to just abuse the slide. When we move from A to C, this is just going from one demand curve to another demand curve. Notice that when you move from A to C, prices did not change. The price was still $300. And even with that $300, under the new demand curve, you, were, you wanted to buy 10. Under the old demand curve, you wanted to buy 8. So there is a change in your demand for that good. We will call it a shift in demand, and we will call it a change in demand. They move mean the same thing. So when you move from A to C, we are going to call that change in demand, we are going to call that shift in demand curve, okay? Well, they are, they are the same thing. So in summary, your, your, demand, your market demand can change in two ways. You, there can be a change in quantity demanded, and there can be change in demand. When there is a change in quantity demanded, you move along the same demand curve. When there is a change in demand, you move from one demand curve to another. There is a shift. So, um, any question? Okay, um, some, uh, some examples. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at some uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, these are supposed to sort of you know, strengthen our understanding. So let's look at the first question. This is a very rudimentary, yet a very interesting question. Simple but interesting question. Okay, which one is the correct answer? Anyone? A. The dot shows that this individual spends $125 on five rock concerts each year. Is that true? 
Is that, is that a demand curve? The question is telling you exactly that this is a demand curve, right? So if this is a demand curve, A cannot be the correct answer. Demand curve shows you very simple uh, you know, information. It shows you at what price, how much you are willing to pay. How, mu how much, how, what quantity you are willing to buy. I apologize. Let's go back. Your demand curve tells you at some given price, how much of the good you are willing or able to buy. So if this is the point of the demand curve, the answer is that the price of the good is 125. And at that price, the quantity that you are buying is 5. Do we all see that? Do we see an answer that supports this statement that I just made? Anyone? So the answer is B, right? It is clearly B. Because B is telling us that when the rock concert cost about... I should, I should be able to do this, and I cannot. Okay, now it's... That's why this technology just became obsolete, right? <laughs> okay, so the answer is B. Next one. I'm gonna, uh, well, this is, this is interesting, but simple, so let's look at that quickly. What do you think the answer to this question is? Somebody said B. Which of the following refers to consumers buying other goods when the price of the good in question rises? Very good. It is talking about substitution effect. Substitution effect says that whenever the price of a good increases, this is the market where everything is homogeneous. You always buy the good that are cheaper, right? So the correct answer is B. Next one. Uh, the next question. The answer is D. The term ceteris paribus means everything else being constant, right? And that's something that you need to make an assumption about if you want to really understand how price and quantity demand changes. These are the questions that are relevant for your exams. You're going to look at two questions. Please take a look at them very, very carefully. I can assure you one of these questions or type of these questions are in your exam and in the next quiz and in the next homework. So what's the answer? So there is an increase in income, and when the income increases and the good in question is a normal good, what happens to the demand for that good? The demand increases, right? It's not an inferior good. If it is a normal good, so the key point here is the good being normal, if the good in question is normal and your income increases, your demand shifts to the right. Right, so the answer is, I apologize, it's the answer on the left. Oh man, sorry, let me delete that. The answer is A, right? Okay, the next one. To simplify, let us think about like this is like a pizza and um, ketchup or whatever, like tomato sauce or pizza sauce. They are complementary goods, right? When you buy pizza, you also have to buy more tomato sauce or whatever. So there is an increase in the price of a complementary good. How, do, how will it affect the demand for pizza? Anyone? Are we all clear that the answer is B, right? Because if the price of a complementary goods go up, demand for that quantity demanded for that complementary good goes down, and since you're buying less pizza sauce, you're also buying less pizza, so the correct answer is B. 
I have approximately five minutes. We are not going anywhere. <laughs> OK. So the next, I'm going to skip the next question. Please read that. We have one more class, and in that class, we need to finish this chapter. I apologize. What we are going to do now, we are going to move to the other side of the market by, by looking at the producers. And we are going to be, be a little bit quicker compared to the time, amount of time that we spend on the demand side. Because the supply side is much simpler. Why? Because uh, in most of the, uh, in almost all the part of this course, we are going to assume that suppliers are these mindless institutions rather than individuals. So suppliers, firms, are the production unit whose sole objective is to make profit. So anything that changes their profit is going to change their supply decisions. Okay. Just like the demand side, we are now going to draw some parallels. We are now going to talk about a supply schedule that talks about uh, how uh, producers or sub firms make their supply decisions. It shows the relationship between the price of a product and how much the producers are willing and able to sell at that product. Again, just like the demand side, the willingness and the ableness are kind of different for a firm as well. But we're going to ignore that. We're going to say that they are the same thing. So we'll have, a, we'll have a supply schedule that will show the relationship between price and how much firms are willing to supply. A supply schedule is like a table that shows the relationship between uh, the price and how much they want to sell. The relationship is fairly standard, fairly simple, right? You can see that as the price of the product goes down, as the price of the product goes down, the amount of profit that firms can make goes down. Are we all clear on that? If the price that you can get by selling your product goes down, you are making less and less profit, right? When you make less and less profit, you are willing to sell also less and less. For a producer, the relationship between price and how much they want to sell is positively related. As the price goes up, they supply more. As the price goes down, they supply less. So the relationship between price and supply for, for the firm is very, very straightforward. When you take these points, when you plug it into a two-dimensional graph, just like we did for the demand curve, we will see that our supply curve is an upward sloping curve, which, which tells us that the relationship between price and quantity supplied which means how much firms want to supply, is, is positively related. This positive relationship is indicated by a theory called law of supply, which tells us that whenever price goes up, quantity supplied goes up. Very simple idea. There is nothing fancy about this relationship. For your demand, law of demand was quite complicated, right? There was this substitution effect, income effect, a lot of discussions about that, our supply curve, and our law of supply is much simpler than the demand side. OK, just like the demand curve, we can think about shift of the supply curve. Anytime the supply curve shifts to the left, uh, shift to the life, right, we are going to call an increase in supply or a rightward shift of the supply curve. Anytime our supply curve shifts to the left, we are going to call it a decrease in supply or a shift in leftward shift of the supply curve. Notice that whenever supply curve shifts, there does not have to be any change in price. With the same price, your supply curve could shift to the left or to the right, just like it did for the demand curve. OK, uh, also the distinction between uh, you know, quantity supplied and supply is critical. Imagine that the original price was P1. And when the price was P1, under different supply curves, the amount that you are supplying is different. Do we all see that? Anytime supply curve shifts either to the right or to the left without any change in price, these are changes in supply. So the supply curve shifted, causing a change in supply. In the next class, we're going to cover two things. We're going to first look at factors that shift the supply curve. And then we're going to bring the market demand and supply together. And we're going to talk about something called equilibrium. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question. I don't know how much they ask for a force ID. Uh, it, 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 should, it, it should not.